Our first speaker will be John Hoffman. John oversees the Lower Colorado River Authority's water, river, irrigation, dam, and hydroelectric operations, as well as surface water management, water resource planning, and other functions. Prior to joining the LCRA, John was a regional manager for the Brazos River Authority and served as the authority's manager of government and customer relations. Other career highlights include serving on governor as Governor Perry's liaison to the Texas House of Representatives and working in the Commissioner's Office of the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality. Let's, let's welcome John Hoffman. Man, that made my head hurt. You're talking about headaches. And, uh, I've been doing this for, uh, for longer than I care to admit, and uh, you just got a really good condensed primer on uh, water uh, law in, in the state of Texas. I'm going to hit a lot closer to home in the stuff that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about what's happened in our watershed here uh, since basically since the middle of last week. Uh, just real quickly as an, as an overview, um, this is the watershed that feeds our Highland Lakes. And, and you're looking at just under 15,000 square miles upstream of Austin, uh, basically stretching north from up around Fredericksburg, going into Junction and Brady and San Saba. The area is uh, considerably larger than a lot of small states in the northeast. Um, in this area here, in particular in the western part of this area here, we received anywhere between three to nine inches of rainfall, depending upon where you were within the uh, Memorial Day weekend. And, and this is on the heels of some previous rainfall events where our ground was, was saturated by the time that this rainfall event came into place. So we had enough uh, rain generated to cause some very significant runoff, in particular in the Llano River, Sandy Creek, and Pedernales uh, watersheds. Um, this is a schematic of the Highland Lakes, and the thing that I want you to take away from this is only the two big lakes, which is uh, Buchanan and Travis, are water supply lakes. And their levels, because of that, fluctuate uh, greatly during floods and during droughts. The other lakes that are in our system, Inks and, and LBJ and Marble Falls and Lake Austin, are what we call pass-through lakes. Not constant level lakes, but pass-through lakes. They are generally very stable, uh, but because they have no flood storage, when we have events like we had during the course of the weekend, we have to make room for the flood waters that are coming in from these creeks and rivers. So when we get these really heavy rains, we have to open up floodgates to be able to move those waters downstream. And that's what we had happen uh, during the course of the weekend. Uh, we had floodgate operations in response to the heavy rains. Uh, and at one point over the weekend, we had nine floodgates open uh, basically along the pass-throughs. We had one open at Wirtz, which is there at, at Lake LBJ. We had five uh, gates open at uh, Starkey Dam, which is on Marble Falls. And uh, that is, uh, was really significant in terms of the amount of water that we had passing through uh, that reservoir and going directly into Lake Travis. Uh, and then downstream of Lake Travis, we had at one point three uh, floodgates open at Tom Miller Dam. We never had any floodgates open at Mansfield Dam or on Lake Travis because we still have a whole lot of ground to make up at Lake Travis. So uh, I did, as you can imagine, a lot of interviews over the course of the weekend. And one of the interviews that I, that I remember uh, vividly was I was talking to Bob Cole at Coke FM. And they were insistent that we had a gate open in Mansfield Dam. And, uh, you know, you kind of go through a thing where it's like, no, we, we don't have a gate open there. Well, yeah, there's a gate open at Mansfield Dam. No. <laughs> I'm in a pretty good position to know where the, where the floodgates are open, and there's not one open at Mansfield Dam. They said, well, why? And I said, well, because it's still 30 feet low. <laughs> we wouldn't have the gate open uh, uh, during an event. We're trying to capture as much of these flood flows as we possibly can. So when we look at the impact on Lake Travis, I'm going to point out a typo right off the bat. That 670 number is not the right number. That's our average uh, uh, depth, uh, our average uh, uh, height usually for this time of year. So when you look at Lake Travis, this morning when I checked right before I came up here, we were at 658, which is amazing. Uh, we literally came up over 20 feet over the weekend. Um, and, and the thing, yeah. <laughs> The thing that's, that's really important for people to remember is this is, on, this is just from flood events basically in the tributary watersheds out to the west. We did not have a main stem Colorado event 
Uh, there's very little. We've only come up, come up about a foot at Buchanan. So we're still waiting for that event to happen in the main stem of the Colorado or along the San Saba watershed, which feeds Lake Buchanan. Uh, so we're, hope, we're hoping that with this wet El Nino cycle that we're in, that at some point the Colorado itself is actually going to get one of these and that we'll receive that kind of uh, amazing record level inflows into Buchanan. Uh, but I guess the bumper sticker for me and what I keep telling the local news media who wants to do a victory lap and declare the drought over with is, no, with all of this, we're still at 55%, 56% reservoir storage as of this morning. So it is wonderful. It is welcome. We are blessed, but we still have to keep our long-term view in mind and understand that we are managing these water resources for this region for the long term. And, and so maybe I'll feel a little bit more relaxed when I see something that's a lot closer to full. Um, so good rains, great runoff, uh, but uh, you're not going to see uh, Hoffman doing the happy uh, victory dance over the drought being over with because it's not. I think an important consideration for people to keep in mind, too, is the fact that um, while the Palmer Drought Index, which is an indicator of soil moisture conditions, is looking very good for the state of Texas, particularly after what we had this last weekend, that is not an indication of hydrologic drought. That's really something that's more closely related to agricultural issues. So our total combined storage is 56 percent. We're at 1.1 million acre feet of water out of a total uh, capacity of 2.1 million acre feet. Uh, and if you think about it another way, that's 655 billion gallons of water. Uh, kind of a parting shot just for those of y'all that work around the lake or recreate around the lake. Um, the debris situation is as follows. Uh, the pass-through reservoirs have actually done pretty well in terms of debris. Uh, LBJ and Marble Falls are in pretty good shape. There's some spots that have some debris on it, but the clarity is generally pretty good. As far as like Travis is concerned, Travis has actually fared pretty well. We have some spots with some significant debris, basically between mile 18 and 19, and then up again around mile 30. Uh, boaters should avoid these areas as much as possible, especially at night. I know everybody's excited about having access to the boats with the boat ramps being open and, and, and getting out on the water with the additional uh, elevation. But there are some unmarked, uh, significant unmarked uh, hazards that are out there, and so people need to be very, very careful about where they're going. Also, the channel marker buoys, as you can imagine, have been moved. And so we have crews out this morning trying to, to move the channel markers back. Uh, and we'll do everything we can to try to work that. There's a whole lot of the debris that's on the lake that's just going to have to be there. And what's going to happen over time is it's going to sink. Uh, and it's a natural part of our lake's process where it, it basically adds to the circle of life uh, on, on Lake Travis and creates, uh, creates part of the food chain for the, for the fish that to make for a healthy ecosystem within our Lake Travis. So that's what I plan to cover this morning. And I'm sure we'll get into a lot of other issues during the Q&A. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Charlene Lurig. Charlene directs the Sustainable Water Infrastructure Program at Ceres, a national nonprofit helping institutional investors to integrate sustainability into the capital markets. In her spare time, she serves as chair of the Austin Integrated Resource Planning Committee Community Task Force and also on the board of directors of the Hill Country Alliance, which works to preserve the spec spectacular beauty and culture of the Texas Hill Country for the benefit of our future. Please welcome Charlene. Good morning. Um, I want to concur with the excellence of the presentation you got earlier from Charles. It was a very um, quick, rapid fire, but extremely um, insightful overview of Texas water law. And it couldn't be coming at a more important time, I think, for the state as we are explosively growing, um, kind of coming off the tails of a drought that hopefully should be a cautionary tale for where we need to be focusing our efforts even as things start to improve hydrologically in the state. And we all have our fingers crossed, obviously, that that's going to happen um, over the next few years to give us the time that we need to actually plan for the drought that we know is coming next. Because as Charles mentioned, we always know there will be a drought that comes after this one because we live in Texas. Um, 
As Charles mentioned, I work with institutional investors. Uh, I, I'm with a nonprofit that represents an investor network with around 13 trillion in assets under management. These are very large, long-term investors who are trying to understand what trends, like the type of water stress we've been seeing in Central Texas, means for their global portfolios of investments. Um, and I specifically work with water providers like Austin Water and others um, to look at it from their perspective as well. Not only how can they um, go to market to sell the bonds that they need um, to raise capital to build uh, water infrastructure that we know that we're going to have to invest in, but also how do they start to transform their business models um, so that they are not so dependent on all of us using more and more and more water because we know there's more people, there's going to be years with much less water. Uh, at the end of the day, that calculation just doesn't compute. We have to start thinking about efficiency being baked into the way that we manage our water supplies. So um, as Charles had mentioned, we did a report back in 2010 that was really aimed at the credit rating agencies and bond investors who were just starting to kind of go beyond just a simple credit rating and look at risk that might be unpriced within the market. And we wanted to look at water scarcity and the ways that maybe that was passing a lot of investors by um, it, as they were looking at very superficial disclosures um, from electric utilities, which need vast amounts of water to produce electricity. We've seen across the country in the past 10 or so years some really unprecedented events where nuclear plants have to be uh, shut back to 30% capacity in the middle of August because the water was simply too hot or there just wasn't enough water there for them to cool. That has huge costs for electric utility customers because now you have to go to the spot market to buy electricity during a peak time of year for water utilities utilities, very, very similar sort of story. In the beginning of the drought in 2009 through 2011, actually water utilities were doing great because they were selling tons of water because you and I were using more of it because there was less rainfall. And where does 30 to 50 percent of water in municipalities in Texas go? It goes to outdoor water use. It goes to us watering our lawns. So the beginning of a drought, they're feeling great, right? Because you're selling tons of water. The deeper the drought goes, the more you have to start um, putting those curtailments in, the lower their sales become, and it becomes kind of this very vicious credit cycle. So those are some of the things we're starting to see more market attention to. We're really excited to see that um, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, which are two of the largest credit rating agencies in the United States, have shifted their methodologies to look beyond just the treatment capacity of a, of a water treatment plant, to look beyond the reservoir storage capacity, which are great details but tell you absolutely nothing about water security because they don't say anything about how much water is in the reservoir, how much water is going to be sent through the water treatment plant. Infrastructure doesn't create water, right? It's, it's the hydrological cycle that creates water and makes it accessible to human use. And we have to start better understanding how that cycle is changing and the risks involved in that. So to turn our attention kind of closer to home, um, I think it's helpful to think about the sorts of dynamics that Charles was talking about in the relationship between our groundwater supplies and our surface water supplies, kind of like we would thinking about as households what our future income and savings are going to be, right? Groundwater is effectively our savings account. It's water that in some places in the state has been underground for a thousand years. I mean, that's rainfall that fell a thousand years ago and has been stored underground. In some places like the Edwards, maybe it fell two days ago, maybe it fell a couple of months ago. So it depends on where you are, but it's that cache of water that you can tap into when your income drops. What's your income? It's your surface water flows. You saw the super crazy volatility in the graphs that, that Charles showed that uh, show rainfall and inflows and other sorts of dynamics that are all about surface water hydrology. That is an, inherently volatile in a place like Texas. And we know in the future that it's likely that it's going to become even more volatile. So if we think of that as our income, um, what should we be doing if the future is likely to involve more years where maybe we get crazy huge amounts of income followed by years with very little? We should be building up our savings, right? We should be at, at the very least not draining our savings. And unfortunately, what's actually happening in the state of Texas is the exact opposite. Um, Charles spoke about groundwater districts and this choice that Texans made back in the middle of the last century to make this a local decision, that it's up to counties or, or regions to decide how to manage their groundwater. Every place in the state that has a groundwater district is required every five years to tell the state what their goal is. In 50 years, how much groundwater do you want to have left? And if you look across the state of Texas, what you'll see is that in virtually every place in the state of Texas, with the exception of the Edwards Aquifer and a few other places here and there, the goal is to drain that savings account. That's the goal. 
So this means we have a looming crisis within the state of Texas because we're more likely to have less reliable income, we're draining down our savings, we've got to figure out how to manage those resources in a more judicious way. And so that's kind of the, the broader goal that we all have. So what's the target as, as a local community? One, uh, and this is something that the task force that, I, that I'm now working on, uh, looking at Austin Water and the ways that we can start to diversify our water supplies, we've got to start diversifying our income, right? That means looking at ways that we can tap into other sources of water than just what we have uh, had historically. For many years, it was completely sufficient for the city of Austin to only have water from the Colorado River and the Highland Lakes. I think this drought has demonstrated that there is a very um, significant difference between water rights and actual water, and that it is an important time for us to step back and look at how we diversify our water supplies. Um, we have to increase our savings rate. And there will be ways that we'll be doing that um, through conservation. There will be ways possibly that we'll be doing that by looking at capturing surface water flows on the Colorado River and storing them underground in aquifers in places where we, can, we know we can go back and tap into that water at a later date. We don't know what the options necessarily will, will be. That's the purpose of planning, is to evaluate and make a rational decision. And, and the third, we have to economize, and it's the same as a household. We have to make sure that we are making better use, thriftier use of the water that we have, and that's really what water conservation comes down to. Um, all of this means, and you're seeing this in headlines already here in the city and, and across the state of Texas more broadly, it means that as we use less water, we're likely to be spending more money on the water that we do use. Um, and it's because we're investing in infrastructure. Water infrastructure has never been cheap. It used to be very deeply subsidized by the state and the federal government. The federal government no longer has the capacity to do it. The state no longer really has the will. Even the $2 billion that we put into a state water infrastructure project a couple of years ago, or, or fund, is a, is a loan-based project. It is not grants. And it means that local communities have to pay their way to build the water infrastructure that they need for reliable supplies. So we'll be using less. We might be spending just as much, if not more. What does this mean for, for realtors? It means a few things. One, um, you know, I think we should be really glad for this legislation that Charles and others and, and the Air, uh, Austin Board of Realtors have pushed through and supported that drives more transparency around groundwater districts. Are you in a district? I think it's important for people to take it one step further and ask, what's your district's goal? Is the goal to drain the aquifer in 50 years by another 150 feet, because that's the goal in some places. And if that's the goal, what does that mean for your well and your ability to access water? Um, deepening an existing well is about 15 to $20,000, if not more. So that's, you know, for some people, not uh, a marginal expense. It's a, it's a significant one. It's something that you have to understand. Um, what's the water demand of a property? And I think it's great to know that there's some transparency around that from Austin Energy's ordinance um, that might help you actually communicate to your customers, your clients, what the indoor water demand is of household and the outdoor water demand so they can anticipate that. Because again, water is going to get more expensive. Um, and then finally, to start uh, helping clients understand the, the real risks and benefits of alternative modes of water supply. Um, I was extremely skeptical of um, people who really proselyt were proselytizing about rainwater capture until I visited some rainwater homes, homes that are living on 100% water that they capture on their roofs and talking to those uh, people about the economics of those systems in a place where it costs $20,000 uh, to drill a well that may or may not get water and may or may not have water in five to 10 years. It costs about the same amount to outfit a house to capture the water from the roof. If you use it economically, even in a drought, there are people who live throughout this drought and never ran out of water um, and are getting water at a higher quality than what you can get through a municipal line. So we have lots of options uh, within this region. Um, I think it's just you know, a critical time for us to evaluate what they are as members of the community, as individuals who are making these investments. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Charlene. Our next speaker is Greg Mazeros. Greg has been director of Austin Water since September 2007. As director, he is responsible for Austin Water's $509 million budget, 1,085 plus employees, and an $840 million five-year capital improvement budget. Prior to joining the city of Austin, Greg served as director of city utilities and public works for the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Let's uh, greet Greg Mazeros.
Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I, I spoke to a subset of this group about a month ago. I found it to be a very informed, very thoughtful group, and so looking forward to questions today, too. Uh, a little bit of background on Austin Water. Uh, Austin Water serves most of metropolitan Austin. We serve about a million people. As described, we're a very large utility, 7,000 miles of pipe. We have three large drinking water plants, three large wastewater plants. Uh, certainly, water supply planning, drought response, risk management is a central function of our utility, and, and particularly through this uh, latest drought. You know, it starts with, with conservation and wise water use. I think that the future water in Texas is going to be much different than the past, and, uh, and that includes how we all change our own personal behaviors in using water. And Austinites have responded wonderfully there. We've implemented a whole series of conservation programs. We have a very strong pricing signal built into our rate structure. We have our residential rate structure is one of the most rapidly inclining rate structures in the nation. So the more water you use, the more pricing signal you get to curtail your discretionary water use. We've uh, improved significantly the way we respond to leaks in our system and reduce lost water. We uh, have incentives for people to save water and tear out landscaping and switch to drought tolerant landscapes. We have educational programs. We've been reusing water, thinking differently about water, not just using water once and returning it to the river, but reusing it multiple times. You know, for example, if you golf on a municipal golf course in Austin, we've converted all of those golf courses from fresh drinking water coming out of the Highland Lakes to highly treated wastewater fluent, what we call reuse water. If you go to University of Texas and some of their cooling towers now use reuse water instead of uh, regular drinking water. Industrial customers all across our system are doing those things. Uh, reuse at the home. You heard about capturing rainwater. Uh, there's a gray water applications now where people are using water that uh, is coming maybe out of their wash water and using that to, to water lawns and plants. And, and that's the future of water, much, much different than the past. If, you know, if that's the one thing that you'd leave here today with is the next 25 years in Texas water is a lot different than, than the past. And the persistent mindset that we're always in a drought. Just we saw those cycles of, of, of kind of bust and boom. We don't want to get where we have a problem, we don't have a problem. We have a problem, we don't have a problem. That's not the case. We really need to think persistently about managing water risk in Texas. Clearly, Texas, if you look at the historical record, is subject to these mega droughts. Even now, oceanic patterns are set up in a way that we're at high risk for very long duration droughts, even though there may be short-term interruptions with flooding events that fundamentally we're going to be in these long-term uh, uh, mega droughts, droughts that last uh, you know, many, many decades. And that's the mindset that we're, we're trying to use in Austin Water. Charlene alluded to it. You know, I've been in the water industry now over 30 years, and, and essentially for most of that time in our history, the, the model, the approach to water is, is we'll supply you almost unlimited water for really low cost. That, that that was, you know, and that, that's, we took a lot of pride in that, that that was what our industry did. Use as much water as you possibly can, and we'll charge you a tiny fraction of, of your household budget for that, and good things will happen. And they did. But that's not the formula for success for the future. I mean, that's been an internal struggle for our organization. 1,100 employees, you know, part of a, a broader millions of water professionals is, is seeing that future changing, uh, where business model adaptation, where we all use water much more wisely, where, I mean, I think the future, just in Austin, for example, if I was here 20 years from now, I don't think anyone's watering their grass with drinking water in the future. I think that's, that's over. That's not going to happen. It might take us 20, 25 years to ultimately get there, but, but that's the model that we have to get, particularly in areas like Central Texas. Uh, realtors are helping us with this. We're working with Home Builders Association. They're about to roll out in conjunction with us a new standard where all future landscapes for all new homes will be drought tolerant. There'll be no St. Augustine grass in the future planted. None. And, and that's just the first step. It, it's, it's a step of understanding the risk that we face. It's, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, Austin Water right now, as we discussed, we're a, currently a surface water utility. We rely on Colorado River water through th really two parts. Uh, first part is uh, our own senior surface water rights. We are one of the oldest water utilities uh, on the Colorado Basin that draws water for over 100 years. So we have strong legal rights to, to Colorado water. We have a rich long-term partnership with, with LCRA. We've been in, uh, in co collaborative 
uh, working relationships for many, many decades where LCRA provides us stored water from the Highland Lakes. But fundamentally, we are established along the Colorado River system. And while that's still going to be a central component of our water supply for the future, we are going to have to think a lot differently about not only how we preserve that water in Colorado, but how we think differently about other sources of water. You know, I mentioned a few like reuse and rainwater capture and groundwater. Uh, Charlene was talking about uh, other techniques like aquifer storage and recovery when we're maybe in one of those those high water cycles where we have some flooding rains and there's a lot of water in the basin that we might take some of that water and store it underground. That's called aquifer storage and recovery, kind of building a strategic reserve of water underground, local in our market, where then we can pull it out and complement our water supply during times of droughts. We're looking at our water system differently. Some of you may have read over the last few months a lot of activity associated with Decker Lake. Uh, Decker Lake is, a, is a, a, currently a, a cooling uh, lake for Austin Energy, but it's a fairly good-sized lake, 33,000 acre-feet of water. It's downstream where it's been getting a little bit more rainfall. Historically, Austin Water never thought about that as a water supply lake, but that drought's changed. And, uh, and we now kind of look at that differently. We're trying to kind of leverage that asset into the future. And, and, and one of many kind of things, LCRA is working to build additional downstream reservoirs to complement the Colorado River system. I'll go back to reuse, this highly treated wastewater fluent. There is no reason, no technology exists that, that, that you, you can't make that into drinking water. Communities do that today. Wichita Falls, you know, they've since broken out of their drought with these recent rains, but, uh, but fundamentally they were experiencing just an epic drought. I mean, over 150,000 people lived there and they were on the verge of running out of water. I mean, you know, just that, that close. They've since converted to taking reuse water and making it into drinking water. That's the future. That's going to be happening in California, all, all across the industry. If you really look at an industry, you know, everyone's downstream of somebody else. What do you think Houston's water supply is? It's Dallas's wastewater affluent, essentially. So this isn't some foreign concept. I mean, it's the ultimate kind of drought-proof cycle. You take reuse water, you, take, you make it into drinking water, high quality, you circulate it back around. You, that's an endless loop that, that you work on. Those are parts of our future. There, there, there's ways to accomplish that in, in a way that's really, really risk-free. I'll kind of conclude. I'll go back to kind of business model adaptation and this theme of the future being different than the past, certainly for Austin Water. I, I, when I was here a month ago, I, I showed a little slide. It was from last summer. You know, Austin Water, through our drought and all of our programs, we cut our water demand, our water use by our community by over 20% over the last few years. We're at all-time lows. Uh, matter of fact, you have to go back 15 years to find a time when Austin Water used more water in a year than we did just last year. And that's really a testament to how successful we can adapt our culture to water. But it's really hurting our business model. You know, we fundamentally uh, don't have enough money to operate. Uh, last summer, our cash balances went to uh, zero, negative, below, actually. If we didn't have a wastewater utility helping us, which is much more stable financially, you know, we, we were essentially uh, insolvent uh, as, as a utility. Um, we uh, had our bond ratings. We're on a negative watch list for our bond ratings and, uh, and may very well get uh, downgraded in the future because of some of these financial risks. So we've been adapting our business model and, you know, kind of indication of how far we have to go in terms of people understanding that is last summer when we raised rates as a part of our business model adaptation and, uh, and the dropping demand, the first thing that happened is Texas Monthly ran a big ad with the bum steer of the month and they gave it to Austin Water because we had the audacity to try to keep our water utility financially solvent through the worst drought in the history of, of our city. Now, I'm telling you, if the future for you is water utilities going bankrupt, that's not a successful future for our, for our community. That water is going to be more expensive in the future, that we're going to have to invest in all these multitude of risk management. And the only way our water utilities are going to be successful is to change their business models and decouple from let's just sell as much water as we possibly can for a really low price. That's not the future that we want. And we're all going to have to work on that because in the end, you, you own us. We're a municipal utility. Everyone in here is an owner. And if you don't understand that, if your clients don't understand that, if they come here and simply look at, why is my water bill higher in Texas than it was in Ohio? You've got to explain these risks that we face and why we're needing to change and adapt. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Thank you Greg. I have said for years, and sometimes makes me a little bit unpopular, that 
Obviously, we want our water supplies and use them in a sustainable manner, but we've got to make our systems financially sustainable. And throughout the history of Texas water, none of us would invest in something where we wouldn't get back a return of our investment for 20 years, right? We want to return on. They didn't teach me my first degree to worry about return of. They wanted to maximize the, uh, uh, the on. The of's important. And we throughout history in Texas have always politically kept the water rate too low. And it's caused problems, and that's something we've got to change. So Greg's exactly right on about that for the future of our, our system. Our next speaker is, is Joe Carr Tedder. Joe is founder and president of Central Texas Water Coalition, 501c4 nonprofit organization dedicated to improving water management planning and policy on the lower Colorado River Basin, protect drinking water for the 1.5 million residents of Central Texas, and finding statewide solutions to the state of Texas water crisis. She has substantial experience as a former educator and administrator, as well as an educational consultant and political organizer. Let's welcome Joe Carr. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, we are a nonprofit. Um, we formed after working with LCRA's water management planning process, and the playing field was not very level. So we decided that Central Texas needed a stronger voice. We're all volunteers, so we're not paid to do our job. We're not tied to a municipality, to a city council, to a commissioner's court, or to a business. So what we have been able to do is think out of the box. We have been able to um, use hard data and sound science for everything we do. We have been able to ask the hard questions that are not always politically popular. I frequently talk about my first LCRA meeting experience. Um, I was sitting next to Ross Crow, who's a water attorney for the city of Austin, and the meeting went on and on, and then they went into an executive session. So we're gathering things up and no one is moving in the entire room. So I look at Ross and I said, what's the deal? We stood up and out of like 45 people, there were two of us from the public. We were the only ones in the room that were at those meetings. So we now make every meeting. We type up notes, we make it available to our membership. Um, we did not have a good partnership with LCRA until John Hoffman and Phil Wilson and the senior management change came in in 2000, last year in 2014. Up until that time, we were treated and viewed, I think, as more of the enemy. Um, when they came in, they were the first group with LCRA who didn't grow up in the system. They came in with outside eyes, so they had a fresh perspective and they were willing to look at things. And all of the things you've heard today are the things that we have been dealing with for, for five years. Um, our focus is on water management policies. When we started this, the drought hit, and we were afraid that was gonna happen. And we were talking about, well, what's the plan if there's a drought? And we were told at that time that it will rain and we thought at first they were kidding. And so we, oh yeah, that's really cute. But no, what do you do for risk management? You know, what, what is your plan? No, no, it will rain. It always rains in Texas. And that was the truth. There was not a plan, or at least if there was one, it was not made accessible to anyone outside the inner core for dealing with drought. Um, and then you get off into um, cost of water, and I know every time I show this when John's going to want to respond to this answer, I know they're in the process of looking at changing the way the, the rate structures are done, but one of the things that we have said from day one is if the water pricing were more equitable basin-wide, you would have people who would conserve better. If you value something, you conserve it. If it's expensive, you conserve it. We are careful with our water up basin. Our irrigators down basin do not have the same history that the city of Austin has with conservation. If the water rates were more equitable, they would conserve more. And that would create more funding for new water supplies and new ways of looking at the water. 
The other thing, all the things everybody mentioned about ASR and all these different, these are not new technologies. The, it was new technology 50 years ago. Solar heating is not a new technology. If you travel, you go to Turkey, they've got buckets up on top of their houses. The sun heats it, it comes down into the shower. We have been spoiled because we have always been the land of plenty. But we now know that if you live in central Texas, we are not the land of plenty where water is concerned. And there has been a paradigm shift in the way water is working in Texas. But the policies have stayed the same. It's all based upon using it all up. Consumption rather than conservation. And that sounds simple, but this is Texas, as you all know. <laughs> it is hard to change traditional ways, but this drought was a wake-up call. This is uh, um, from the Lake Travis Economic Impact Study, and I left this in even though I had put this together prior to the flooding. But I think it's really interesting because you can see at 650, um, you start having severe economic impact on your lake. And we're now at, what, 655? But you have to realize that the marinas have been out of water for years. The makeup, to make up the economic impact that has been devastating to the businesses and to the residential areas. You know this better than anybody. Location, 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 right? Waterfront, everybody wants it. When you have to look out with your binoculars to see where the water is flowing, it's much, much harder to sell those properties. And what do you tell people? Oh no, the lake's gonna fill up. Well, I don't know when. You know, they're saying it's not, it may not fill up, so what do you do? And it's that, that truth. But you guys do an excellent job, I think, of getting educated. I always like to talk to your groups. Realtors are the best because you know. You know water is important and it makes a difference. We work on the water management plan, and that's what um, John has been working on extensively with LCRA. The water management plan determines how much water stays in the lake and what the trigger marks are when the water is released. Okay, so we have done a lot of work in trying to include current hydrology which is how much water has been coming in. And if you followed any of the inflows, you know the inflows in 2011 were the lowest historically. 2014 was the second lowest. Um, seven of the last nine have been the lowest inflows in recorded history. And they were right on target. The fact that there was a flood and these lakes are up does not mean anything. When the lakes hit a level, and I will flip on this one, as they did in 2011, we had 1.5 million acre feet. But because of the plan that was in place and the decision that was made at LCRA to send water down basin, it emptied out half the water basically in Lake Travis. The new water management plan that we have been working on since 2010 has finally gone back to TCEQ and we are now waiting for its approval. When that happens, there'll be an opportunity for public input, and then we hope it will be in place. In the meantime, we've had to get emergency drought orders to keep from having to send water downstream. And that's just the critical element. Everything is confusing about water. It is extremely complex. You've got Texas Water Development Board with their state water plan. You've got TCEQ with the water management plan for the river basins. I always like to end with this one because it's the one that is really, you know, you kind of use it and it's just kind of cute, but it's really, it's really the real thing. You start out with drought, people get a little concerned, but as it continues, you start having panicking, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Then you have a little rain, and it didn't even have to be a rain like this, just a little rain, everybody says, oh, Hallelujah, the drought is over. The drought is not going to ever be over if you live in Texas, if you live in hill country. We are floods, it's feast and famine, it's floods and drought. 
And the way the hydrology is working, it is we were getting more and more semi-arid. And that's just something we're going to have to accept and deal with. So that's it. I tried to keep it to five minutes. Charles, I don't know how I did. Thank you very much. It will rain again here, but we've got some big issues in, in water in, in, in Texas, and we're not ob oblivious from those issues in Austin. As realtors, uh, as licensees, we have fiduciary duties to our clients, right? When it tells you three times in the rules of the Real Estate Commission that you've got fiduciary duties, that probably means that they mean it, right? And you've got to be uh, scrupulous, meticulous in the way you represent your client. If you've taken the legal ethics courses, which you have, we've defined that as being exercise extreme and excessive care and details, right? So we've got to know about water. Water renders the land its value. Very, very important. We've got to employ prudence and caution so as to avoid misrepresentation in any wise by acts of commission or omission. So if we omit sharing with our client the need for them to understand about the water regulation jurisdictions, I think we don't serve our client well. We want to continue to add value to the transaction. So that's what I wrote a water course about for agents, which some of you have taken. Now, we have some real headaches in Texas water, and I've got a few slides to kind of kind of adapt you to it and get a feel and warm us up today. One of the first things I want to be able to say to you is that our water world is a world in Texas of drought and deluge. There's no such thing as normal. And the first slide is one that's not of Texas, but it was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, and it shows the mega droughts that happened over the last 2,000 years in California and Nevada. Now, there's some pretty good science that says within the next 35 years, we're liable to have mega droughts across the United States, especially down here. But we're used to droughts, right? When someone asks me to describe the weather in Texas, I pretty much say it's, we're soon to be back in drought at any one time. If you look at the Palmer Drought Severity Index charts over Texas, and the Palmer Drought Severity Index is more than just counting tree rings. It includes the soil conditions and the ability to hold water. That goes for 1,700 to 1,900. And you can see if the middle line there is normal, there's no normal. It's either drought or deluge. We go through these periodic major droughts. Uh, and every time we have a major drought, even in Spanish colonial Texas, there were, there were policy changes made. Now, we're trying to get ahead of that in Texas. We ought to be proud of that. But we're always going to be involved in that. The 1950s drought, you can see the major changes that happened. And the 50s drought didn't end in 1957. It went on and extended. Uh, if you look at things like in 1917, you see a big drop there. We changed our Constitution that made it the duty of the legislature, not the choice, the duty to conserve our natural resources. 1925, we had a case called Modal versus Boyd that talked about who owned floodwaters. All those policy things happen and are very important to consider. Again, if our most precious social value in Texas is public school education through the 12th grade for free, we've all, all back to the Republic of Texas, it was so critical to us. Water renders the land its value, right? Land without water has less value. Our public schools are funded by abnormal taxes, like it or not, right? So we need to be careful about that. When San Antonio takes the water from Castorville, what happens to that community? And those are the kind of battles that we're going to face. Now, we have some headaches. So the first long-term water problem is we're going to deal with the drought to lose. The second is that we don't manage our water in Texas policy-wise based on the hydrologic cycle. A water molecule in Texas changes its ownership like a chameleon. As it comes through the cycle, it rains on the ground. As it comes across the ground, it's called diffuse surface water. You own it if you capture it before it goes into a water course, right? Goes into a water course, something that has intermittent or permanent water on the surface. It's owned by the state of Texas. When it pops underground, it's owned by the landowner. So that water molecule in Texas is like a chameleon. As it goes through this cycle, it changes ownership all the time, which makes it complicated. You may remember when we were kids, we'd walk in creeks and the water's kind of warm, and then all of a sudden you'd feel cold water on your toes. That's an aquifer feeding the creek. You go back and further up, you'll see a little whirlpool in the creek bed. You'll see it feeding the aquifer, and this happens continuously through the cycle. Tom Hatfield, who's an ex-dean at UT, a good friend of mine, wrote the book Rudder. In 1964, he wrote about the difficulty in having a central policy for water in Texas. He wrote a, his master's thesis about the 1950s drought, and he said, you know, the worst drought in Beaumont history is about 16 inches of rain. But you apply that to El Paso, and that's double the rain they get in a normal year. 
So we have people in Austin trying to make decisions on a statewide basis on a state with, great, uh, with a lot of variance, which makes a difference. Now, as I said, so you can understand it, I wrote a book about water rights to help the people understand better what they are. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a hydrologist. But if you look at water rights and think about water from three different, the geological containers, you can get the clue really quickly. Natural surface water, water that flows in a bed and bank, no matter who owns the bed and bank, is owned by the state of Texas, held in trust for the people, and managed by the TCEQ, period. It's all allocated, without a doubt. We, the TCEQ passes those rights on to the LCRA and the other water authorities and manage it in that way. Diffuse surface water is owned by the landowner if you catch it before it goes into a water course. And it's supposedly managed by the TCEQ, but we're kind of, we, we do to a degree. The big, the big gorilla is groundwater. That's water that's beneath the ground in aquifers and pools. And we try to manage it by groundwater conservation districts. That leads to another one of our headaches. That is, we don't have groundwater districts all around the state. Even though since 1949, reconfirmed time and time again by the legislature, that's our preferred method of managing groundwater. Our real source for water in Texas is groundwater in the long term and some other ideas I have in a minute. Now, we don't manage surface and water, groundwater conjunctively. As I mentioned, these containers relate conjunctively, but we don't manage them conjunctively. CC, TCQ does a good job managing water, but I asked the other day, I asked a friend of mine at the Water Development Board, who's an expert, fabulous guy, tell me, before we had the rains, do you know how many groundwater wells have been drilled in the upper watershed of the Colorado River since the drought of 2011 got so bad? He said no. Well, obviously, if there are groundwater wells drilled there, you can't blame the people there for drilling the wells to save their crops, to pay their bank debt, right? Take care of their kids. But there's an impact there because those groundwater wells affect surface water from the USGS in all kinds of ways we don't understand. We've got nine major aquifers, and I think we've got more than 21 minor aquifers because we kind of group some aquifers together. So, and they're infinitely complicated. So you can see how difficult it is to figure that. Now, groundwater districts, one of the big problems I think we have, again, our preferred method is to manage by local controlled groundwater conservation districts. We passed the bill in 1949. We called them groundwater conservation districts. You know why? If we'd have called them groundwater regulatory districts like they should have been called, we'd have never passed the bill. Texans don't like the word regulations. But let me tell you something. You will understand as realtors and as landowners that groundwater districts do have some regulatory authority and they will make a difference to the value of our lands and our situations, right? If we ever give them any money to operate, we don't give them money to operate. Local folks like local control. We understand that. But we don't, we have a choice to give them Avalorm tax power. And if they don't have enough fee base and don't have Avalorm tax power, they've got no money to operate. I wrote a journal article from studies a few years ago that's in the Water Journal about ground finance and groundwater districts. Only one in my study had more gross revenue in a year, gross revenue, than a McDonald's makes. Only three had more than the finish line tennis shoe store at Barton Creek Mall makes in a year. The one that had the most increase in revenue from one to the other was Brewster County. They went from $13,000 a year in gross revenue to $20,000. They can't even open an office, yet that's our preferred method of managing groundwater. So we need local control because of the oddities of the local cultures in the water. But we've got to figure out a way to give them some money, I think, and that's something we don't like to pay, right? Taxes. So it's something to consider. Now. We have, we have made it, one of the problems with groundwater districts is no one really knew about them. Uh, so through my many speeches around the state and going all over the state, most people don't know what a groundwater conservation district is. Most people here don't want to know what a groundwater district is, right? Travis County has no groundwater district. We have a little sliver in the bottom, which is the Barton Springs Edwards Oxford district. But everywhere else in the county, there's no district. There's no district in Val Verne County. There's no district in Williamson County. So in those counties, the old rule of capture runs. That means he who has the biggest pump gets all the water. There's some modifications of that. And I'm waiting to see in Travis County what's going to happen. When, one of the when my neighbor and I drill water wells and I pump enough water out from under his house that cracks his slab, that's called subsidence, and that's the one modification. The others really don't apply. So there's a lot to be said for the rule of capture. There's a lot to be said against the rule of capture. So 
we made an effort at the Austin board starting two years ago, Joe Babb and others, we got together and said, we need to help the people of Texas begin to understand what our groundwater conservation district is. We felt the best way to do that was to modify the seller's disclosure notice and add a sentence. Do you as a seller know whether or not you're in a groundwater district or not, groundwater conservation district or not? Now, there are all kinds of problems. There are mapping problems. There's all kinds of headaches with that. But we put that in effect at the Austin Board about a, about a year ago. We've had no complaints. So we decided to change the property code, section 5.008. And in a two-year process, we went to TAR, the Austin Board, the Texas Water Conservation Association, the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Districts. We got unanimous approval to add, to change all the seller's disclosure notice in Texas to add one simple sentence. That is, is the property in a groundwater district or not? We started out this way. We ended up with this language. Any portion of the property that is located in a groundwater conservation district or a subsidence district. I testified at the House Natural Resources, the Senate uh, Business and Commerce, and it passed unanimously. On Monday, it went to the governor's desk. Now, think about this. Over the next 10 years, if you assume we do more than a million total listings around the state, right? Just assume a million in a year. You've got a listing agent that has to read that sentence, right? You've got a seller that has to read that sentence. You've got a buyer that has to read that sentence. They may not pay attention to it, but at least it's there for them. That's 30 million people in 10 years, right? You add the buyer's agents, it's more than that. So we've got a very subtle way to help people understand it was very, very important. And I think we ought to congratulate the Austin Board of Realtors and leaders, leadership here for taking the effort to make that work. It's very, very important to the people of Texas. Now, two other things I want to say before we go forward to our speakers. First of all, we've got headaches in Texas, though, because we don't allow water transfers around. No matter what the law says, right? You can see what's going on in Wimberley and Bastrop. I don't talk about those areas. Uh, we've got all kinds of headaches. We've got the Vista Ridge Pipeline, 142 miles down to San Antonio, right? 3,400 people have signed leases to run water to San Antonio. Guess what they don't have yet? They don't have the right of way. And I've been screaming if I had tonsils, they'd have been spit out a long time ago. Right away acquisition takes 10 or 15 years. We can't wait 10 or 15 years if, we've got, if we believe the, what our predictions are about long-term drought problems. Another thing we've got a problem with, our court system for water cases, the major cases take 15 to 20 years to come to some conclusion. The David Daniel case, Bureau Day and, and Joel, Joel got older and Bureau Day died, and we got an advisory opinion in 2012. We don't even know what's going on. It went back to the Tascosa County Courts, and guess what? They settled for 900 grand, 950,000. That didn't pay the legal fees, but people wore out on it. The Bragg case has been around since 1996. Went back to the Supreme Court again the other day. They punted it back. So we've got real headaches in, in those kind of directions. So that's something else to consider. The last thing I'll say is that desal works, and desal is a future for us. Watch the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority study about desalinating seawater, up to 250 million gallons a day. And they already have a distribution system. In fact, Buter now is negotiating with the GBRA to provide water, which may take some pressure off the Wimberley nightmare. Okay, so those things are coming. So that is a, as an overview, we do a good job in Texas. We look out 50 years to try to plan water. We're beginning to try to implement those plans. The Ceres Group did a great report in October 2010 that you've heard me talk about. They analyzed cities around the United States based on their water plans and their implementation. And they recommended cities that were not planning for water recommended drops in their bond credit rate. Now, our money comes from New York, like it or not, for bonds. You know, it's the way it is, it's the way it's always been in history. I can prove that to you. But it's really critical to consider we've got to not only plan for water, we've got to implement it. And we're making some progress in that. Atlanta didn't make progress in that. They had no water in Lake Lanier. And I'm looking forward to hearing Sharon and Charlene talk about that. I'm going to start out the questions and ask, throw this up to the panel, then I'll have maybe a few others, and hopefully you all will then generate some. I can ask a lot of questions, but you'll get tired of hearing me. Um, we've got Richard, I'll call him Tricky Dix, Millhouse Nixon signed on December 28, 1973, the Endangered Species Act. The federal government has supra, S-U-P-R-A, legal authority over many areas, and part of that's water. I'm worried about Cibolo Creek where my ranch is. There's endangered species studies that may cause more flow in Cibolo Creek to protect the freshwater mollusks. That's great. There's worries about, since the San Antonio gets their water from the Edwards Aquifer, 
we've capped their use of 572,000 acre feet a year. But if there's more flow needed from San Marcos Spring and Comal Springs to protect endangered species, which we want to do, the only way you're going to get that is to reduce the amount of pressure in that aquifer, right? So how do we choose between that? Give me, let's talk a little bit about what y'all think about the super legal authority. I remember when the LCA board, correct me if I'm wrong, but Myron Hess came out today that the LCA board, I think, mentioned let's keep more water in Lake Travis. And Myron Hess said, wait just a second, you mean you're going to, I'm paraphrasing, and he could come fuss at me. But what are you going to do to Matagorda Bay while we're still, why are you, we're still watering carpet grass here, St. Augustine grass, what about Matagorda Bay? So speak to that a little bit, please. <laughs> okay, so um, we did in fact go there. Uh, that would, that would, uh, and, and under the uh, revised methodology that we have in place that is a drought based, drought stage based methodology for the bay, uh, uh, guaranteed uh, releases to the bay was curtailed because of the drought that we were in. Um, and it received what, it, what could be called subsistence level releases to the bay. Now, this spring that has reversed itself. And, and now we're in a situation where the bay has received, even before this event, the bay had received uh, hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water with essential nutrients and, and oxygen and uh, lack of salt. For, for the freshness of the bay at a critical time for, uh, for the flora and the fauna of the bay ecosystem to allow the critters such as shrimp and oysters and game fish such as redfish and trout to be able to reproduce. So um, it's an interesting question to ponder in Texas in terms of endangered species policy versus water allocation decisions. With the exception of the Edwards aquifer, uh, I don't believe we've had any huge train wrecks like you've seen in California and other places where there have been literally uh, state water policy driven by federal endangered species concerns. There is a, a, a court case pending right now uh, based on the Hooping Crane mm -hmm. the, on the Guadalupe River Basin that could change that. Um, but thus far on the Colorado River, we have not really had that as a, as a um, over riding driver for water allocation decisions. Now, if you thought water politics were explosive in the Colorado River Basin before, just overlay uh, federal agencies and intervener uh, plaintiffs mm -hmm. driving water policy and water allocation decisions in this river basin on top of what we already have. And uh, if you thought the whole whiskey for drinking thing was tiresome before, uh, you just went to wood grain alcohol in terms of the uh, of the fighting piece of it. So, uh, I mean, that's my observation so far. Very good. I think it's, I'm glad, I mean, it's important to consider that because the whoop, the whooping crane lawsuit sure shot across, across their, a, a shot across everybody's bow. The freshwater mussels could be the issue, though, in Texas that end up driving us because there's a whole lot of field work being done right now, including in the Colorado River Basin on some potentially uh, listed species that are freshwater mussels. And a lot of those freshwater mussels that's believed have to have a certain type of uh, riparian condition for them to exist and reproduce properly. So basically, they have to have the right kind of flow in the right kind of place at the right kind of time. That's right. It's a big balance issue, and it's a hard balance issue. Any of y'all other? Anybody else want to comment about that? Or you want to? Go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, the Endangered Species Act is an extremely cumbersome tool in many ways, um, but one that in places like Texas um, sometimes is, is really the only effective tool that we have to ensure that there's water in rivers for people. Um, and this is especially true from the perspective of managing groundwater, which is really strongly connected in so many parts of the state to surface water flows and the water that's available in a river. If you're looking at buying a property on the um, upper reaches of the Guadalupe River, or in Valverde County, or in so many places in Texas, that water comes from underground. And because of this way that we have artificially divided water rights and uh, who has standing in deciding how much water can be pumped, and preferentially treating groundwater owners over surface water users, uh, in some places it means that the ESA is the only thing that keeps water flowing for people. And that is, I think, a sad state of affairs. But until we are at a point in the state where we are willing to actually not, well, to put money aside so that we have base flow in our rivers, 
I, I don't know how else we get around it. From the perspective of real estate, I mean, it's, it's, it's strange to me that the policy discussion has been so dominated on the side of, of private property rights by those who really want to uh, commoditize and consume their water, and that there has been su such relatively little organization uh, and consistency of messaging among those who would stand up in defense of the pro property rights of people who believe that water has a value to the land, even if it's not consumed. Um, and, and that's something where maybe other people have kind of more prescient or insightful things to say. Well, that's, a, that's end up going into a correlative-based system, but where there's a right associated with the ground, uh, with, with the groundwater in the ground. And groundwater conservation districts, at least, have been very loath to go down that road for fear of someone bringing up past regulatory decisions that weren't based on that and, and suing them. So even though everybody admits that, that I think is, has delved into this issue in any detail, that if you left to your own devices and you could start from scratch, you would start with a correlative-based system and have some relationship between the surface and the water that's in the ground so there's value associated with it such that it could be protected as a real property right, it it's, it's basically goes back to rule of capture. And if you can you know, bring it to the surface and put it to beneficial use, then it's yours. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, I would like to add just one little thing on Matagorda Bay. It's always been a, a, a hot button with the upper basin and lower basin about when the water was cut off to interruptibles down basin that it was devastating to Matagorda Bay. So we had um, Dr. Jordan Ferns, our hydrologist, do a study and our study actually showed that Matagorda Bay actually received more water when the rice farmers were not getting water than when they were. And that was based upon 2012 through this year, um, the water, we've had the emergency drought orders in place. So the, I think the other thing, being an old time environmentalist is that nature adapts. You know, before you had river authorities, you had feast and famine, flood and drought in central Texas and things survived. And so that always makes me feel a little bit better, but it is true with the population increase, you have to look at um, the drinking water for people as well as protecting the environment. In 1850, there were 693 people living in Austin. <laughs> so, you know, it was a whole different flow now. Right now, there's 1.4 million in Travis and Burnett County, and that's where you're Highland Lakes run. Well, that is a lot of people, and it's a complete change in the dynamics of the way things happen. 693, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they were the first ones to come here and try to figure out how to, don't tell anybody about it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's just for us. Well, Greg, I've got a question for you. Um, is the city of Austin considering any plan as a contingency to drill any groundwater wells for backup? Have we thought about that? We, uh, we are uh, in the process now of doing what's called Integrated Water Resource Planning, uh, IWRP, where we're looking at over uh, long-term horizons in 30, 50, even 100 years. We have an advisory group uh, that's assisting us. Uh, Charlene's the chair of that, a citizen group, uh, working also with our council. And we'll be evaluating all those types of strategies about um, other water sources and uh, potentially, you know, which could, which could include groundwater. Although our community has voiced a lot of preference for localized water resources, uh, water resources that are developed more locally as opposed to, say, a large importation of water from, uh, from counties outside of our general market area. You know, I think one of the themes that's coming out, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and risk associated with groundwater and groundwater districts and the laws that they rely on and that we want to be kind of thoughtful and do a lot of risk scenarios and, um, and, and ultimately develop uh, water supply solutions that endure for our community. You know, we, we don't want to make a short-term decision that may cost billions of dollars sure. that turns out to be uh, on a shaky foundation. And, and so I think we're, you know, we're cautious about uh, drilling groundwater wells in any kind of short period of time. We want, you know, data and facts and, uh, and uh, stakeholder input to help guide us where we make these better decisions. You know, we're not taking anything off of the table, but then again, with that said, we're not prioritizing anything above anything else either at this time. Sure. Just curious about it. Um, John, I think it would be helpful. Uh, I gave a speech 
a year or two ago with Becky Modell, and, and she made it clear to the group at the University of Texas to kind of define what a pass through, what, how we misuse the constant level lake. Could you share that with our audience? Sure. Uh, the pass through reservoirs, um, and this is not unique to the Colorado River Basin, there are other reservoirs in the state that have water uh, that uh, the levels have historically stayed pretty stable but they're not constant level lakes, even though some people market them as such because it has a lot of attractiveness in terms of the market. Um, when you look at our pass-through lakes, uh, in particular, uh, LBJ is probably more stable than others because we also have a power plant on, on Lake LBJ. Uh, we have, a, 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 in fact, we just built another uh, power plant and tore down the old one uh, on Lake LBJ. And, and for the sake of using that water as cooling water for the power plant, it has to keep within a certain operating range, usually of a couple of feet. Um, in the past, the, uh, the pass-through lakes, which would be you know, like Marble Falls and LBJ and Inks Lake and, and, and Tom, uh, uh, Lake Austin, uh, impounded by Tom Miller Dam, they stayed uh, static because we needed to keep a relatively high level in the lake to generate uh, hydroelectricity very efficiently. Uh, there's a certain amount of pressure that water creates for itself, and the higher the lake level is, the more pressure it creates as it, as it forces water through those turbines, and it's more of an efficiency issue with, with respect to hydro generation. Now, for years, hydro generation was all the electricity in Central Texas that we had. That's how we electrified the hill country. But shortly after LCRA started building power plants, it became very clear that there was a more efficient way for us to be able to generate that electricity, and hydro increasingly was used only in conjunction with releases made for water supply. So we didn't make uh, releases of water just to generate hydro anymore. We would generate hydro when releases of water were being made for uh, people downstream of the reservoirs. So um, where we stand right now with respect to the pass-throughs is kind of an, an uneasy piece that we have with people that live around the pass-through reservoirs because they have thought of them as being very, very stable, almost constant level lakes. Uh, and they have been managed very stably over the years. Um, one would have to wonder what the prospects will be if we get into this mega drought cycle that people talk about where we have an extension of the one that we've been in and you start to see reservoir storage levels go below 600,000 acre feet where you really have to look at managing more of a range within those pass-through reservoirs. Uh, it could cause some very interesting discussions to have uh, happen uh, over, over the long term about those. But at the end of the day, they are not water supply reservoirs uh, purely, uh, 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 Lake Travis and Buchanan are, uh, and they have no flood storage associated with them. So anytime you have a big rush of water coming in, like I talked about earlier, we have to make room for it. And that, what's why that's important to us as realtors is that we have to represent to people when we sell those houses, you know, out, out on the lakes, on the lakes that are, quote, pass-through lakes. We probably might want to be careful about saying constant level because somebody might not like that. You've got a question. Wonderful. Yes. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, um, I'll take a first stab at this. I'm sure everybody else will probably want to weigh in at some point on cedar. Um, uh, having been raised in the Texas uh, Hill Country in West Central Texas all, all of my life, uh, there's an ongoing and bitter battle between cedar and mesquite and, and, uh, and human beings, whether it's for range health purposes or aesthetics. Uh, it, it, uh, there have been some very interesting works at the micro watershed level in terms of spring flows uh, associated with cedar. But you are correct in pointing out that there are two, primarily two uh, endangered species, listed endangered species that have uh, habitat concerns associated with old growth cedar, uh, black cap vireo and golden cheek warbler. And we have preserved spaces in Travis County and in the region here because of those two, two bird species. So uh, there is a concern with unmitigated uh, uh, destruction, uh, particularly of old growth cedar, so it has to be done with uh, with some uh, judicious oversight. Uh, you know, the spot cedar clearing on your property on relatively small, like homeowner style clearing, is not an issue. But when you're talking about large scale clearing, it's it's a it's a bigger deal. In terms of the overall picture, the jury's out as to whether or not it does a lot to help surface water. 
uh, in, in, in any big measurable amount. In fact, there's been some studies here recently on the part of Texas A&M and some of the land-grant universities that seem to call into question some of their previous research talking about the wonderful water supply benefits that come from large-scale land clearing. Uh, they point out that there is definitely a range health benefit and there's an indirect water supply benefit that comes from the range being healthier but you can't draw a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, correlation between the uh, the clearing of brush and and, and surface water supplies in, in particular in terms of the downstream reservoir uh, there's been a lot of issues uh, people asking questions about the down, downstream reservoirs like why are you building that down there there's nobody down there that's only going to benefit those those blankety blank rice farmers uh, the, the issue for us is if you take a look at the at the annual rainfall just between the hill country up here that feeds our watershed and the in and, and the lower part of our river you're talking about roughly the 20 to 25 inches difference in rainfall we had event after event after event in the very first quarter of this year and the latter part of last year that was happening austin and downstream and we had no way to capture that rainfall and it's just like a banking scenario where it's basically there's cash flowing out and we got no no account to stick it into and because we have no account to stick it into when it gets dry and we have and we have firm customers downstream as well as these interruptible customers we have to make releases from the highland lakes to be able to take care of those if we had the ability to capture those flows downstream and use them in an off-channel reservoir and cycle that reservoir to take advantage of these events when they occur in the river it just makes smart water management sense and the way you got to think about it in terms of benefit to the to the area around uh, uh, the capital city here is every acre foot of water that we're able to capture and utilize locally potentially is an acre foot of water that doesn't have to come out of storage from from up here and if we're able to manage that reservoir storage conjunctively with the reservoir storage that we have up here we have much more flexibility in terms of the overall picture and it literally means additional water up, uh, upstream up here so that's the relationship between the between the the project that we have in place right now and, and our existing reservoir system anybody else want to answer have a comment about that yes question Growth population, we're expecting it to double. So, Joe Carr, are we going to have 3 million people in this Travis County burn it um, in a few years? And in that case, will we be able to interrupt the firm customers downstream? Not the firms, no. They'll be treated the same way as firm customers up here are treated. Firm customers are firm customers. Interruptible water will then get called into question, absolutely. At the same prices? No, none of these prices will be the same. None of these prices would be the same. But I think there will be a more fundamental question, and some of the speakers touched on it earlier. Um, we need to reclaim the debate away from the traditional development versus anti-development discussion that you've had about water supplies, because that's really not where the discussion is. The truth is, a discussion about discernible water use and essential water use, what do we have to have for our communities up here, and what do we want to have for our communities up here? There's no such thing as looking at our future here and not assuming that there'll be some additional supplies brought to bear, but there's also not a scenario where we're not gonna be conserving water and using it differently than what we are today. And the truth is we wanna make sure as a public policy matter that we don't lay the groundwork for a future that has already de facto made decisions for us in terms of water usage that we can't back out of. And I'll give you an example. You don't wanna de facto make a decision about what your community looks like based off of uh, landscapes that are not supportable and in effect take off the table water that you would otherwise have for the next Samsung. Because we all know the dollars that are generated with those big revenue and job generators that are out there. So what we wanna do is make sure, and I, th I think the city of Austin is doing a fantastic job of trying to vision this future that's, that goes towards a point where you let economic decisions and business decisions help drive those water consumption choices and policies in such a way as to marry our existing supplies with judicious new supplies and using water and thinking about water differently so that we continue to be the economic driver of the state i think yeah i don't think that could have been said any better and i, I think it's especially important um, for us to, to really look hard at the data and what the data are telling us about how water use in the United States is changing and how we need to question some of our assumptions about population growth and whether or not that necessitates a future in which we are collectively using more water. Um, that had been the assumption for many, many years. 
There are places all over the United States that invested in multi-billion dollar water supply projects, assuming that that was going to be the way things panned out as their populations grew, uh, and, and found out that in fact, water demand was just not chalking up to what they had projected. And that's a problem for all of us because we're all paying the bills for the water infrastructure that gets built no matter how much water you use. Um, and that can be extremely costly. I mean, it's hard to come up with a water supply project on any scale that services a place like Austin or the Austin metropolitan region that is less than a billion dollars. I mean, you can maybe find some projects that are half a billion dollars. You can certainly kind of shift operations and try to make, make better use of existing infrastructure and that can cost substantially less. But I mean, the, the price tags are really spinning out of control and so we have to i think look very rationally at the question of uh, what are the data telling us about how population is related to water use it turns out the two have very little to do with each other um, and then how do you actually direct your your water choices so that you are driving toward uh, more reliable water for all sectors and the most economically effective and productive uses of water and that's hard it's uh, it's obviously not just all about cold hard you know rationale. There's a lot of like values associated with that as well. But we got to remember this this myth that population and water use go hand in hand is is really a myth. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. You can look at what San Antonio has done. You can look at what Austin has done when <laughs> when urban areas get serious and spend money to educate people and to put programs in place to deal with real conservation, you see a change. I think the hardest thing is for people who might cut back and not take 30 minute showers when you're in the middle of a drought, that the minute it starts raining, it's like, oh good, <laughs> I can go into the shower for 30 minutes again. I, I think that's the thing about the paradigm shift that we, we as individuals have to do. We have to really accept ownership in what we do and what each of us do does make a difference. Yes. I'd like to know if there are any variables and you're obviously weighing the right things, but what what could you could you tell us the vision of LCRA for the future for the Highland Lakes? Huh? Yeah, the, the, so the, the, the vision of the, of the LCRA for the Highland Lakes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think the vision for the LCRA with respect to the water side of our business is, is obviously the Highland Lakes are the, are the heart and soul of that. Um, we will be looking to diversify our supplies and adding additional supply to, to, our, to our portfolio of supplies. So what starts with the Lower Basin Reservoir at some point is going to result in additional supplies downstream. But our focus here over the next several years is going to be on trying to create additional supply in the, in the uh, I-35, 130 part of our, of our area. Because we're all looking at the same data points in terms of our growth in this region. Um, we understand that it's going to take some additional supply over the long term to be able to bridge us into what that future that we've all just been kind of talking about looks like. So. Um, I think uh, the Highland Lakes uh, will continue to be, uh, again, a, a big part of who we are uh, as, as an entity, a big part of our identity. It's very interesting. Uh, when I came to LCRA, one of the things that surprised me the most is how small the water part of the LCRA is. You know, because water takes up all of the, uh, you know, the public information piece of what we do. Our board meetings are, you know, our fights are all over water. But it's 4% literally of the revenue of a billion dollar company. Do the math. You know, so it's all, you know, it's 96% of the headache and 4% of the revenue. So people are passionate about it and that's one thing that's really good because, because of that passion, it's always going to be something that allows us to have a great uh, and informed debate with people that care. It's not like we're out here operating in a vacuum and we have a, a stakeholders that don't care what happens. So going forward, I think what you're going to see is more people at the table, and that's going to make things different than what it's been in the past because there's going to be more diversity and more voices at the table when we look at it, the, the making these management decisions. Um, but I think we'll also have to keep in, in mind the fact that consumption is going to be a part of that, and there's always going to be this difficult, uneasy balance that we have between consuming that water and people that love it 
for the recreational asset and the aesthetics that it presents and what it does to our local economy and trying to balance the impacts of those things out. Because frankly, if we're going to decide to take half the Highland Lakes water off the table to support our local economies, the water planning that we've done for this region, including the city of Austin, is not worth the paper that it's printed on. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, let's play Nostradamus. <laughs> Good uh, you know, we hope that they act uh, to, to, they go out soon, like in the next 30 days, uh, on notice. And that's the first step to be able to go out and re-notice the water management plan. Uh, and that'll be a process where they'll basically send uh, a draft of their assessment of the water management plan out along to stakeholders all over the basin and allow people to come in and give their comments and say if they would like to participate in, in a contested case. Assuming that that goes smoothly, it could be as early as September when we start to go into more process-oriented stuff at TCEQ. It is a complete wild card Q&A after notice because it all depends on who shows up and what they say and to the extent that they engage as to what TCEQ does with that. If we were to get through the summer and have nobody protest this water management plan, frankly, because it's, it's done a better job of balancing the interests, all of the stakeholders bought off on it, and it's, frankly, people are tired, uh, it could very well be that we could see something in the fall from TCEQ, and that's our hope, because we would really like to see the new water management plan in place before we go into next year. If it's full on contested, you're looking at another year to two years of going through TCEQ's contested process and we'll be having some spirited discussions over emergency <laughs> orders. Susan. You mentioned that it cost a lot of money to produce, uh, or use a lot of water to produce the electricity. Uh, conservating and conservation for the water is very important, and I agree with that. So what are we going to do to help educate folks that they need to conserve on electricity as much as they do for water when you drive around the city and the buildings are lit up to the hilt in the evening and there's no one there? That's one of those tough bouncing discussions that you have to get into. And, and uh, the comment I made earlier was talking about hydro. And hydro is really a small part of what we do in terms of our, our electricity. It's valuable for us in terms of the, the, uh, the revenue associated with it because most of our, our, our uh, revenue from hydro generation happens from being in reserve. There's a, there's a big premium placed on the ability in case something happens to the grid to turn hydro on because it, it can put uh, power out into the grid immediately. And, and to the extent that you've got a power plant that goes down, you have to have power to bring a power plant back up. That's where that really is. It, and it's a security issue for, for power for the state of Texas. So in terms of our own uh, 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 power generating facilities in the Colorado River Basin, um, the older facilities are the ones that struggle in terms of, uh, you know, gallons per kilowatt hour uh, generated kind of, kind of things. And, and the most recent one that we just built is very, very, very water efficient. It's a combined cycle gas facility. And I think in terms of new generation facilities, that's what you're going to see going forward. Uh, but the ones that we rely on for our base load are all older and they have a higher water consumption uh, associated with those. Um, energy consumption is a tough deal. I don't even know how to get off into that in terms of what, you know, we rely increasingly on power. And trying to balance that out, goodness, there's think tanks right now that are spending the careers of entire people trying to do this energy water nexus and the balance between the two and what the future looks like with increased need for power generation and water consumption. Yeah, I, would, I, would, I, I just would add, uh, on just from the Austin perspective, one, we work very closely with Austin Energy, Austin Water and Austin Energy sister departments as a part of our water planning process. They're a part of our water planning in terms of their water use. As you are probably well aware Austin Energy is uh, probably the leading utility in the nation in terms of environmental issues, uh, switching to more sustainable power supplies, wind and solar, which don't use uh, really water at all. They're modernizing their other plants. I mentioned Decker Lake. They're evaluating their whole Decker uh, power system, whether or not they're even going to need a power plant there. If they do, it'll be a low water use one in the future. Uh, even on the water side, you know, we use a lot of power to move water and we're constantly evaluating how to move water more efficiently in our system, reduce our power consumption. Um, I, 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 I see a lot of positive trends in that direction myself. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, an extremely complex issue, but a, a really important one. Just a couple of things kind of come to mind. I know there has been obviously a huge amount of leadership done within the city of Austin on diversifying into energy sources that are less water intensive. Um, and there's been, I think, a growing amount of interest in the surrounding region um, in those types of energy resources, but a lot of resistance um, that I think it takes lots of different people to try to overcome. One example is the Pernalis Electric Cooperative um, has had some shifts um, at the board level where there was a lot of resistance to this kind of nascent uh, or growing interest among their co-op members in uh, low water renewable energy sources and energy efficiency and solar and wind um, and a real um, intentional drive to try to keep kind of board leadership focused on traditional so, uh, types of supplies of, of energy which are extremely water intensive. We, we dealt with this um, you know, and continue to deal with this, I think, um, within the city of Austin around this question of what happens with a, a gas-fired power plant that may eventually be retired or, or might not and where you have kind of a real time example of attention within a single community about where water is used. Is water gonna be used for drinking water storage in Decker Lake? Or is it gonna be used for uh, the next generation of whatever type of power plant, if any, um, replaces the one that, that's there today? Um, so I think you know that's something that's gonna be uh, out there for years to come, but it's also hidden, the opportunities are hidden in strange places. And I think this is one of the areas where the task force is really eager to see how we can look at opportunities within the city of Austin to look through energy consumption um, and, and ways of uncovering water supplies that are, exist within the city today that just aren't being tapped into. And one of them is in the heating and cooling systems of every major building in downtown Austin, huge consumers of water um, in, in a, that are, it's constantly evaporated off. Um, and that's a, an area of water supply at the local level that a lot of places that have had far greater um, droughts and water scarcity places like Sydney, Australia, are looking at for water supply options in the future is, is tapping into those um, sorts of opportunities. And that's something that I think Austin uh, Water has begun looking at, but I mean, th there's no shortage of them at all. And I think it really takes a, a critically minded business community kind of looking at the economics of water and, and we're getting there. We're getting to a point where the cost of water services actually will start driving some of those investment decisions by big commercial owners because it's it's gonna be a two year return. And, and it's like, we're just at that kind of tipping point. Just the, the other water energy connection I would add is, uh, you know, often people will bring up like desal, like just if we're by the ocean, let's just go desal ocean water or desal brackish groundwater, but that brings in the energy nexus. I mean, that, that to, to desalinate water is hugely energy intensive. Uh, I mean, you almost have to build a power plant next to your water plant to desal water, and then you have the residuals, the salts to deal with. So this thing is, you know, very, Co-mingled. That, that's why it gets so expensive. You know, you look at like desal water. The reason that people don't do desalination is is it just comparatively. Uh, there was a graphic up on the screen of uh, LCRA's raw water charges for for um, Highland Lake Waters, one hundred seventy-five dollars an acre foot. An acre foot's about three hundred twenty-five thousand gallons of water. About enough water for four or five. Austinites. Desal water costs probably in the $2,200 to $3,000 range per acre foot. So you did because of power and residual management. So, you know, these things get very expensive, very complex, very, very rapidly. I, I want to make two, <laughs> two points. Um, one is I'm, I'm a big desal person and I was very slow to come to that. But to me, it just makes sense when you look at Texas and if you look at what that what has happened in all around the world where desal plants are in, Melbourne, Australia has one of the best systems I've ever seen. Israel has done, everybody else has done desal. So it's not that it's not doable. It is just that it takes the leadership at a state level to step up and say, here's our problem. Here's a possible solution. Let's get out there and do some research and see what we can find out. There were several bills that were in the legislative session this time that some moved a little, some didn't go anywhere. But Texas is a traditionalist. Our, our basic way is traditionalist. And people sitting in the state capitol aren't you. They don't look like this room looks. 
Do you know what I'm saying? You've got, you've got a, lots of attorneys. You've got a lot of older gentlemen. You've got people who've been there a long time. You've got people that built up a power base. And that's why I keep, every time I talk, I say, make your voice heard. Pick up that phone and call the people. Your elected officials will respond if they hear from you. But there's a lot that's been done with DSAL. Your oil and gas people have done fantastic research. They have portable modular desal units now. There are a lot of studies out there um, marrying the desal with, a, with solar. So do your research. It's, there are a lot of things happening. The other thing I want to say is um, Charlene mentioned the, the issue with uh, a lot of the um, energy um, fights that are going on now at the board level. It's happening right now at PEC where you have, and their election is going on right now, which is what popped into my mind when, when she said that, you have people who are running saying renewables are the way to go. And then you have other people running who are saying, well, you know, this, 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 and so there's all that smoke and mirror stuff you see. You need to, if you're part of that PEC group, you need to look at the material that is sent out to you and vote appropriately on your ballots for those people because it's a critical decision that you're making very good yes ma'am in the back ask you are there people are there people in west texas and north texas that are concerned about water like it seems like the we have here in central texas oh yes oh absolutely if that, yeah, in my, my trips out around the state, they're tremendously concerned. Uh, a lot of people out in West Texas have been, you can't blame them, the ranchers have sold their water. To, there's a lot more fracking going on than you can imagine, reworking wells. But now what they're finding is in the areas where they've got very slow charge re, uh, aquifers recharge, they can't sell all their water because if they sell all their water and their windmills go dry, they may lose their ag valuation. And then all of a sudden that money you get for the water just goes right back in in, in, in rollback taxes and everything else, but they're very concerned. I noticed when I went to the Texas Municipal League meeting about water uh, back in January, the smaller communities are, I say smaller, that's not, they really are smaller than us. They're getting together and planting regional brackish desal plants and working together. The big thing we don't pay enough attention to about all these systems is the time it takes to get right away and the cost of the distribution systems. That's my headache with desal. I think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm Jim Murphy's doing a good job at GBRA right now, planning and on a $400,000 federal grant to figure out can they do DC water desal along the coast? What's it really going to cost? But the big part of that is the distribution system. I start to try to figure out how much the desal costs. The numbers all across the board, and many times the numbers aren't fully flushed out. So the whole system's a big process. But yes, the West Texas people are are in their own way and they're in, into it very much. And you had a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm getting more personal on this. Uh, I've worked with some people that are looking to purchase land or have purchased land east of us uh, towards Bastrop. And of course, they're very concerned if uh, uh, they will be able to have a well or if there is a well or we really don't even know sometimes if there's a well on the property. Is there a map that shows us the water districts? Is there a relationship between LCRA and these water districts? Do there, are there laws that uh, have them having to fill up their wells like they seem to have happened here in Austin back about 15, 20 years ago? What is that whole relationship there? And obviously, if these wells are continuing as they seem to be from here to Smithville, uh, that's taking water out of the lower Colorado. And so how does LCRA handle that relationship also? Wow. That's a hard <laughs> question. So for the rest of my doctoral thesis, uh, um, those are really good, thoughtful questions. I think you need to start off with the premise that um, the law, the state of the law with respect to groundwater in the state of Texas is fairly well defined in some sense, and that, uh, and, and it was mentioned earlier that the groundwater conservation districts are the preferred means of managing groundwater in the state of Texas. Uh, and there is a fair amount of case law supported by guys that make a whole lot more money than Greg and I do that, that bill by the hour 
that have pursued the litigation that has resulted in the case law that underlies all of this. When you look at the Lost Pines District, which is basically Bastrop and Lee Counties, they have been a very, 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 what's the best way for me to say this? They don't look uh, favorably upon uh, permitting of, of groundwater resources. They're very protectionist in the way that they approach permitting groundwater resources. And that can be a double-edged sword. When you're talking about purchasing property in this area, it depends on whether you're talking about buying a lot for a house or buying a ranch. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're buying a ranch and you want to leave open the possibility of developing it as, as a lar you know, large lot subdivisions or, uh, or a, a concentrated type development, um, your prospects for getting groundwater permitted for that are very different than if you just want to get a domestic well because those are exempted under, under, under the current law. Um, in terms of protecting uh, permittees, uh, that district may be more so than others has been very, very uh, forward leaning in the way they look at, at, at managing future users, some would say at their expense, uh, to protect existing users of the water. Um, the Lost Pines District has been very difficult to get permits out of. Um, we don't have a strong relationship with the Lost Pines District. We've worked with them. We just had some permits that we got on some property that we own at, a, at the Lost Pines Power Plant uh, that we got for us for, for, uh, for water supply for our, our power park there. It was very, very difficult for us to get our permits. It was very, very difficult. I mean, that's land we've owned for a long, long time. And, and uh, it was basically instead of how much water can you permit for that land, it was how much do you need and how much do we think you need. Uh, and again, this was on a property that we own. We have an arrangement with the, uh, the Boy Scouts over uh, a ranch that's not far from there uh, for groundwater rights associated with that 5,000 acres, but we haven't gotten any permits for it yet and don't plan to for the immediate time being because of some of the uncertainties associated with trying to permit groundwater in the state of Texas, and in particular in this area right now. In terms of the effects of groundwater withdrawals on the river, that is an area of, uh, of expanding science in terms of trying to draw a relationship between the two. We know there is a relationship. We don't know to what extent deep groundwater withdrawals affect uh, 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 water supplies in the river itself. Groundwater, shallow groundwater supplies, there's a pretty well understood relationship between the two, but these deeper sources, it's, it's more difficult to draw a, a tangible relationship between the two to understand what the effect of these drawdowns might be on the river itself and base flow. Does that, does that answer your questions? <laughs> I'll comment then one more question of yours in just a second. Let me make a quick comment, then we'll, then we'll finish up. The House Natural Resources Committee did an interim report on water that came out in January in, in speaking to this kind of general thing. And it's just not Bastrop, it's around the state. Yes. It said very clearly that the water code does not allow discrimination between you know, to, to, for a district to discriminate transfer of water outside the district. But it also depends on science. And here's what's going to happen. I haven't been an expert witness so many hundreds of times. A jury's going to have to decide someday between three different hydrologists' reports and tell that all say three different things as to what the science says about these aquifers. And the problem I have, and I'm, in fact, I'm writing another book, my dissertation is going to be about does Texas need a special water court? And I'm comparing to the Spanish water courts of old that dealt with things in a year instead of 15 years. So, yes, sir, your question. Yes, um, you talked earlier about the uh, 30 to 50 percent of water use has gone to outdoor use. And mm -hmm. so from a conservation standpoint, a policy standpoint, um, what are our big ideas about how we're going to address um, future new developments and drought tolerant plantings um, and, and also whether it's in a new development or a single lot in the city. Uh, we've done well with uh, creating impervious cover rules, but this is sort of the next step. How do you tie that into uh, drought tolerant landscaping anytime somebody wants to get a building permit in town just to renovate or as well as build um, so that we can be more conscientious about how to use the water we have. I can start. Please. Well, uh, good good question and good perspective. I mean, I, I would add kind of some context there a little bit. Um, traditionally, historically, uh, outdoor irrigation has made up a large portion of certainly municipal water use, and uh, that is Austin's history, although with the drought and our drought 
uh, and conservation strategies, the proportion of water that goes for outdoor use has dropped significantly for Austin's market. Uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, that Austin uses less water per day or today than we did even 15 years ago, even with a growing population. Uh, our outdoor water portfolio has probably dropped from about 50% of our water to less than 25% of our water. You know, we, we've been in. Um, we've been obviously a very early adopter of conservation. We early adopter of water restrictions. We've been in one day per week water restrictions here in Austin for almost four consecutive years. And not just um, kind of wink, you know, like, hey, maybe you should water one day. I mean, we will fine you. We write thousands of fines and warnings a year. I mean, we are serious about it. And, you know, that's had a profound effect in reducing water demand. Uh, I think just in terms of my own thinking, I, I don't see Austin going back to uh, two day per week watering probably in the future. I think we could very well be in one day per week watering forever. I mean, I, that's a policy decision for our council and others to weigh, but, but I, I, that's kind of my thinking, you know, after four years in one day per week watering, I think we're, this trend of reducing outdoor water use needs to continue. Uh, in, in part, it's gonna happen a lot of ways. One, it's gonna take the existing inventory and, 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 and changing those, those landscape uses. Um, I mean, I'll just speak to my own experience. I live in a traditional uh, a kind of subdivision uh, in the city of Austin. And um, when I moved in seven years ago, we had a very traditional lawn and I had banana trees growing in the back for my neighbor. And, uh, you know, I don't have banana trees anymore. I've lopped off a third of my sprinkler heads. I have rocks where my park strip used to be. Um, I think those small steps that are happening continuously are gonna ultimately convert more and more landscapes. As I mentioned in my remarks, I think very soon we're going to be making an announcement in cooperation with the Home Builder Association that all future landscapes will be drought tolerant to start off with. So as new people are moving here, uh, it, it's going to be uh, drought tolerant landscapes. You know, we're continuing to do incentives. We have all kinds of incentives that we do. Like, you know, we had if you agree to not replace your lawn if it died during the drought, you know, we'll pay you not to replace your lawn to replace it with more more drought tolerant landscapes. So you know, those kind of things are going to happen. Pricing signals is probably really important. As I mentioned again in my introductions, Austin has a very steep inclining block rate curve. The first few thousand gallons of water you use, you pay $2 a thousand. But once you give above 10, 12,000 gallons a month, you're going to pay $10, $12, $14 a thousand, again, to make you think more wisely about water. You know, one cycle of an irrigation system would often use two to 4,000 gallons of water, just one cycle. And so, you know, you really want to encourage people to, to, to manage that much you know, much more effectively. Now, I will say, I'm talking a lot, but uh, 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 a lot of outdoor water use is discretionary, but not all. You know, people water foundations to keep their, their houses stable. I mean, that's important. You know, that, that's a, a kind of a public safety issue. Austin loves its tree canopy. You know, we would not want to lose our tree canopy. I mean, if you were to go through a 2011 90 days above 100 degrees, and those are going to be more common in the future with climate change, um, you could you lose the entire tree canopy. So, you know, we do see some importance to preserving the ability to water outdoor to save like tree canopies and, and those kind of things, but, um, but, but, but certainly a, a much, you know, a lot, a lot longer uh, way to go, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll get there. I think our society is changing rapidly in that regard. I think, you know, there's some really interesting models of where we might be headed. And I think, you know, it would be great if all the water utilities and muds around Austin Water were doing what Austin Water is doing. I'm not sure that they are. So, you know, what's what, what Greg and his, his team are doing may or may not be representative of what's happening in the broader region. Um, but it, it, exactly that needs to be happening across the board, both for existing housing inventory and new. And if you look at places like Vegas, um, they instituted their cash for grass program maybe five or six years ago, they've spent $30 million just in the, the amount of bond funding that they've put toward just cash for grass, just pay, buying uh, turf grass back from people and putting, putting it out of commission and putting more appropriate desert landscaping in place. Um, you've seen really kind of similar stuff happening in Phoenix that means Phoenix looks nothing like it did back in the 70s and 80s. And you can actually see it as you look at the new areas that have developed, that it's just a completely different type of housing stock and type of outdoor landscaping. In Colorado, we're looking at communities where for a single family home to be built and attached to the water system, it's $30,000. 
uh, for the tap fee to connect because that's how expensive water is in the state of Colorado. And there you're seeing really interesting developments in impact fees um, that would differentiate between a house that intends to put turf grass in and a house that intends to put um, you know, uh, climate appropriate landscaping that can knock that impact fee down to 2,500 bucks. I mean, that's real money talking. We don't have impact fees that are that high in Texas, which I'm sure many of us are grateful for, but you know, th th that's kind of the direction that we need to be heading in so that we're not just kind of having you know, a soft touch out there and trying to shift uh, landscaping uses, but actually you know, putting money in, in place so that people have a real financial incentive to make that change. Okay. Well, as Paul's walking up to say a couple of finish, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, one more question? No, no. Oh, Bill, come on up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Was this terrific? Thank you. Thank, thank you to Charles and this, this great panel. Uh, Charles showed a chart earlier showing the cycle from concern to panic to apathy. I, I think we've all learned today concern needs to remain constant here. Notwithstanding the irony that while we were sitting here, I got text notices of severe storm warning in Travis County and severe storm and flood warnings uh, in Hayes and Travis County. So uh, this little pause in the drought isn't over yet. Um, this is one of two government affairs forums we'll have this year. The next one will be in September. We will pick a uh, topic as we get closer to that. We want to make sure it's timely and important. Uh, between now and then, the Austin Board of Realtors will host another forum on June 30th. Anybody correct me on that? 24th, uh, covering the coming changes from the Consumer Financial Protection Board for those who are anxiously awaiting August 1st and all the changes that come with that. But before we wrap up here today, I just want to uh, quickly thank tremendous staff effort here, especially Andre Lewin Mutroff. He has done a terrific job organizing this, finding all the panels. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny has been a, a major arm in our promotional efforts here. And um, on the volunteer side, myself, uh, and I didn't introduce myself officially, by the way, I'm Bill Morris. I have the privilege of serving as the 2015 chair of your legislative management team. Our vice chair, Katie Hall, is here close to the front row. <coughs> and Diane Kennedy, sitting all by herself in the middle of the room there, uh, is the chair of our water, issue, water issues policy team this year. <laughs> Lastly, and we are just a couple minutes late getting out of here, if, if this is interesting to you and policy issues generally are issue, interesting to you, please come see me uh, or call me after this and let's, let's talk about getting you involved in this process. Uh, the legislative management team uh, is supported by several policy teams that year round are studying policy issues as they relate to here. We uh, relate to the real estate business. Uh, we work closely with city and uh, county governments around the area. We interview candidates in election years, and we'll be doing that again next year during the legislative sessions. We spend a lot of time more on the lobbying side of, of things, if you will. Uh, but if you'd like to get involved, we would love to have you volunteer a little bit of time over here. We understand in a busy market how difficult that is to ask, but I think everybody involved will tell you, one, it's fascinating, two, it's important, and three, it, it makes you more valuable to yourself, your business, and to your clients with the additional knowledge and information you come across working on these things. So, Susan. I have one last question for Mr. Brown. Uh, you mentioned our seller's disclosure and the information that's being asked of sellers. Can you direct us to the place where we can see where the borrowers or tenants are so we can give it to our sellers? Absolutely. On our disclosure notice now, you want to go to the, to the TCEQ site. You click on groundwater and go to water planning and assessment, and you'll pull up that map they update every every uh, month. Now, the good news about this is I had lunch with Carlos Rubenstein last Wednesday, or Monday, I can't remember which. He's chairman of the Texas Water Development Board. I said, Carlos, one thing we really need, we need to have a search box that I can put in 2985 Brody Lane and tell me what district I'm in. 
And he jumped all over it. He immediately said, let's not only do that for groundwater, let's put in who, if they're in the LCRA's jurisdiction, let's put in everything for one location. Because the Railroad Commission's got that now. And so it'll take a while, but that's coming. But at this point, that's, that's where we're headed, and that's a great question. Go to the TCEQ site. Click on, you'll see on the front page, you'll see groundwater. It's up at the top. Click on groundwater. Go to the groundwater planting assessment. You'll see, go to GCDs, you'll find the map. Yes, Ben? Yeah, I was talking about the groundwater only, but also in MLS. In MLS. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Evans. The A-Bars seller's disclosure includes the website to go to to find that information. Right, absolutely. And please, if you, we have a dozen of those groundwater districts, if you can believe it, in our MLS system now. If you're out in those districts, one of the things that everybody told me when I interviewed all those district managers, nobody comes to the meeting except somebody looking for an irrigation permit, it's, unless there are these situations like in Bastrop. So please go to the groundwater meetings, because they, they really will listen to us. And we, I think realtors all take the lead in this water policy issue across the board, in my opinion. Right. All right. I'm getting the ax signed from the back of the room, but thank you all for being here. We very much appreciate it and look forward to seeing you in future forums. Thank you. I gotta travel with you.